Welcome to today's service for the third Sunday of Easter. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The reading for today is from the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a, string, a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing, honor, and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The human heart is an idol factory. So wrote John Calvin, the father of Presbyterianism. We were created by God to rely upon, adore, and obey him in life. But sin, the sin we inherited from Adam and Eve turns our eyes away from God and in upon ourselves so that we set our hearts upon the things that we believe will satisfy the desires of our hearts. Though these things are not God, we often treat them as if they were and we worship them. A glaring example of such idol worship was displayed on, in a, on a large scale in Russia on March 18th. <clears throat> Mr. Putin and his allies long for a glorious homeland. Military conquest is their chosen means to that end. The Kremlin's propaganda machine has successfully convinced the majority of the population that 
Uh, Ukraine is a dangerous enemy, a persecutor of the Russian population in their land, and an enemy to be conquered for Russia's greater good. Not all Russians embrace this lie, but those who attempted to speak out and resist found themselves arrested or they fled the country. Even the Russian Orthodox Church offered itself as a mouthpiece for the Kremlin's deification of Mother Russia. But the spotlight shone brightest in favor of this state's violent program of national idolatry, as I said before, on March 18th, early in the war. Russia's troops had met at that, by that time with fierce resistance from Ukrainian forces. The member nations of NATO had were hitting Russia with wave upon wave of punishing economic sanctions, and there were reports that among Russian troops, morale was low. And so to counter this, the government staged a televised war rally in a large soccer stadium in the city of Moscow. As many as 200,000 people gathered to hear Mr. Putin promote the military action and denounce its detractors. National colors were on display everywhere. There was music, a multimedia presentation showed people throwing Ukrainian flags upon the ground, and a song was sung. It's called Made in the USSR, which has the opening line, Ukraine and Crimea, Belarus and Moldova, it's all my country. The rally was a blasphemous worship service in praise of a false god called Russia. But our hearts create and cling to idols of many other kinds, too. The hope of the glory that's associated with competitive sports drives many pro athletes and those who cheer them on to great acts of devotion. Players commit their whole lives to training for excellence and improving their skills in search of success. Sometimes they've done so at the cost of families and even their own health. Fans, of course, dress in the colors and fly the flags of their beloved teams as they flock to stadiums and arenas and sports bars to enthusiastically witness the performances of their teams and sing their praises. And the feats of our favorite sports heroes command more interest and admiration from us than the words that tell us of God's greater works of creation and salvation, then we have begun to worship a God that is not God, and we are guilty of idolatry. Luther teaches us that anything that we depend on for ultimate good in life can become our idol. In most cases, the things that we desire are not evil in themselves. Money is not the root of all kinds of evil, but loving it as if it were it possessed, um, as if possessing it amounts to life's greatest good, is idolatry. Popularity and social acceptance can be true blessings, but not if we long for them so desperately that we are willing to spread false rumors about others to improve our own reputation in comparison with theirs. Wherever we care for something more for something that God made for us more than we do for God himself, we have taken a gift and turned it into a God and a false one at that. Pride rather than money is the real root of all of our evil. It drives us to raise ourselves and our desires and preferences and our families, our heroes, our church, our work and play, our city, and even our nation above God in importance. And when we do that, we worship those things to our shame. In stark contrast to the idol worship that so thoroughly corrupts this world, John describes a vision he was given of heaven in today's reading. John saw God enthroned in heaven. 
angelic beings surrounded him. Four of them, called living creatures, shared the form of a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a human. Twenty-four human-like beings, known as elders, who represented the people of God of the Old and New Testaments, sat on thrones around God. They held harps and bowls of incense whose smoke represented the prayers of the saints. First, John heard this congregation sing a joyous hymn to praise God as the maker of heaven and earth. And then, as we heard in our reading today, a mighty angel filled all of heaven with his great voice to ask, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? God on his throne held this scroll in his hand. Like a legal document, it was sealed seven times, probably with sewn knots. To keep its, <clears throat> that was how its contents were kept hidden. Was anyone fit or worthy to answer the call of that angel and to open the scroll? In the last chapter of the book of Daniel, the aged prophet who lived through tumultuous times of transition between the reigns of Babylon and Persia, received some insight into what lies ahead at the end of human history. But he was told to shut it up, to seal the revelation he had received and written on a scroll until the time of the end. The scroll represented the destiny of humanity on earth. In John's vision, the angel announced that the time for its opening had arrived, but the question still remained. Who is worthy to take the scroll and open it? At first, no one came forward to receive it. In vain, John scanned the heavenly court to see someone come forward to take command of the scroll and of the things yet to come. The silence that filled heaven crushed John, and he wept. Now, I don't believe that John was surprised that no one was found worthy to take that scroll from God's hands. Looking back over history, I'm sure he could have called to mind uh, the memories of many who tried to make themselves king of the world. Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, and the Caesars of Rome. All of these had taken their shots at that prize, but to no avail. Their kingdoms were from this earth, temporary, and corrupted by pride and greed and violence. But John wept as he waited seemingly in vain for a worthy one to appear. He wept for the lost and condemned race of humanity, divinely created to bear the glory of God's image, but fallen so low as to live out its days foolishly playing in the mud and muck of self-glory and evil ambition. How right it and just it was that no one from our family could light and lead the way ahead for sinners. But oh, how sad. But then, then one of the elders addressed John. He commanded him to cease his mourning. He told him to look and to see the one worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, and to oversee the fulfillment of its prophetic message. The elder introduced him as the lion of Judah's tribe and the root of David. These titles tra trace back to the blessing given to Jacob, or that Jacob gave to his son Judah, and also to the royal promise God gave to King David that one of his descendants would reign over God's throne forever. But what John saw was a lamb, though not an ordinary one. The lamb bore the mark of a deadly wound, though he was very much alive. From his head grew seven horns, a symbolic witness to his divine power and authority. Instead of two eyes, this lamb had seven to represent the complete knowledge and insight of the Holy Spirit with whom he was anointed. To God's throne, the lamb approached, and he took the scroll from God his Father. Yes, again, John was seeing Jesus. This time, he did not see him as the exalted, glorious Son of Man, 
but rather as the Lamb of God who laid down his life to take away the sins of the world and took it up again in resurrection victory. Jesus is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For Jesus came down from heaven to become human, conceived by the Spirit and born of Mary. For us, the God-man Jesus Christ lived a holy and righteous life, pure from all sin. He relied upon God his Father alone. He adored him completely, obeyed his will flawlessly all the way to the cross where he died for our pride, idol worship, and every other evil. Jesus is the Lamb who was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and punished to bring us peace with God forevermore. For us, Jesus was slain, and for us, God raised him that he might ascend to heaven to reign with him as our divine human redeemer, high priest, Lord, and judge. With John, we see Jesus our Savior. He holds the scroll and fulfills the will of God that it reveals. Here is our King who is worthy of our trust, adoration, obedience, and worship. Here is our God, the true one. Join in heaven's new song and to, to sing to his praise. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Jesus is the one worthy to reign as king of all creation. He is our king. For by his grace, we believe that he has ransomed us with his blood to be people of God. He has called us his servants. We no longer live for ourselves or the gods of our own making, but as royal priests of the Lamb who, who proclaim his love for people, and who pray that they may receive his gifts of repentance and faith so that they too may join us in the true and everlasting worship of God. We see Jesus and we sing his heavenly song. Each time we gather here together for worship, we sing with the heavenly choir that John saw. Here Jesus teaches us love, trust, and hope through the word that we read and preach and sing and pray. Jesus gives us eyes to see th through those false forms of worship in this world and to reject its idolatries. He gives us ears to hear and hearts to obey his call to serve each other as husbands and wives, as parents and children as teachers and students, as pastors and parishioners, employers and employees, and as governors and citizens, as he commands us. Our King reigns. He gives us the promise of his forgiveness for all of our sins and eternal life as the anchor that keeps our souls through all the storms of life that we experience. We see Jesus our King, so we sing his heavenly song as we wait for him to return for us with glory, glory everlasting. Amen. Now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, having heard the word of our King, let us confess our faith in him in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have raised your Son from the dead to the praises of all angels and saints. Give strength to our hearts and voices that we with them would meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and speak of the might of your awesome deeds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever living God, you raised up Saul from among your enemies that he would suffer for your name. Stir up all those who are baptized into your name and call many men to service of your church. Give wisdom to the seminaries of our synod as they labor to prepare young men and women as church workers. Sustain all those who are missionaries and suffer for your gospel and continue to confound your enemies with your wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, one generation of your saints commends your works to another. As we have received your glorious gospel, grant all fathers and mothers among us strong and joyful faith to declare your mighty acts to the generation to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, enthroned in heaven, you have ordered all the nations of the earth and have set your church among them to shepherd them unto eternal life. Hear the prayers that we continually offer for our rulers and grant them faithful and peaceful reign. Wherever there is war and conflict, bless the efforts of those who work for peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate Lord, you are glorified in the suffering of your faithful people. Teach us to trust you through all of our trials and graciously bear up those who struggle among us so that they would know the fullness of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, dear Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God and merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Blessings to you this week. Bye for now.